Well, good morning, Walden Church. We are in the middle now. We are in week five of our fall sermon series, Living Your Best Life. And every week we're addressing just one small shift that we can make in our lives that will keep us more aligned with how God wants us to live. Making our best life reachable, making it obtainable. Because I don't want you to think that your best life is out of reach. It's not impossible. Your best life isn't behind you. Last week, uh, we talked a little bit about how to add more of the Word of God into our lives, how the Bible can improve our life. And today, I want to look at another basic element of our spiritual life, and that's prayer. Because the truth is, if you want to know God, you want to have a relationship with Him, then we have to have conversations with Him. But that can occur if you stop and talk and take time to communicate. And let me just say, nothing supernatural will ever happen without prayer. If we ever wanted to unleash God's power in our lives or in this church, then we're missing out if we don't recognize that prayer is one of those key ingredients. Good and even great things probably happen all of the time, but the out-of-this-world miracles will not take place if we are not praying. And prayer is not one-sided. And that's the shift that I want us to think about today. Prayer involves a dialogue. It involves a relationship with God. And a relationship is a two-way path between sheep and shepherd. But sadly, the majority of our prayers look a lot like a one-way conversation with God. God, this is my situation. You know, I've done all I can, and now help me get out of this mess. And then we push the button on the vending machine. We treat God like a genie. We call God on the phone. We run off our long laundry list of needs, and then we quickly hang up. Jesus says in John 10, Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him, the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name, and he leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. And this figure of speech, Jesus used with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. You know, Jesus says in verses 3, 4, and 5, he calls, he leads, his sheep follow him because they know his voice. His sheep do not recognize a stranger's voice. You know, when most of us pray, we're just crying out to heaven of all the things that we need or want or miss. And then when they don't show up, we say, God, are you even listening to me? God, are you even paying attention to me? Are you hearing me? But we might ask the same things of ourselves. Are we listening to God? Are we hearing him? Don't we believe that God still speaks to his people? Don't we believe that we can still hear the voice of our shepherd? And if he does speak, who does he talk to? In the very beginning, in Genesis chapter 2, the Bible says the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. And verse 25 says, The man and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. Who does God talk to? Naked people right? Absolutely. It's true. Adam and Eve came into the relationship with nothing. They were totally dependent on God, and they only started to change the relationship when they sat in the driver's seat, when they wanted to drive the car, when they wanted to take control of their own lives. That's when the relationship changed, and God banished them. You know, perhaps when we go to God in prayer, we should be imagining ourselves more like Adam and Eve. 
humble, exposed, out in the open, nothing to hide, raw. There is nothing that we ever could hide from God. There's nothing ever we should hide from God. Who does God talk to? In 1 Kings 19, it says, There Elijah came to a cave and lodged in it. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, and he said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? He said, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. For the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets in the, with the sword. And I, even I, only am left. And they seek my life to take it away. And he said, Go out and stand on the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind tore the mountains and broke in pieces the rocks before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, the sound of a low whisper. And when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his cloak and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. And behold, there came a voice to him that said, What are you doing here, Elijah? Who does God talk to? People who are zealous for him. What does zealous mean? Well, zealous means to have a, a fervor of spirit. There, there is an energy, there is an enthusiasm about your faith. The believer is eager to embrace and pursue and defend Jesus Christ in everything that they say and do. They're, they're all in. They're on fire. They're sold out. Elijah wasn't content to just go with the flow. No, he swam against the current. Who does God talk to? The Bible is full of these stories. From the book of Genesis, all the way where God speaks to Moses and Aaron and others in the Exodus and in the wanderings. In the book of Numbers, God speaks through a donkey. In the book of Ezra and Isaiah, God even speaks through a pagan king. The disciples hear God speak in a thunderous voice. Paul hears God on the road to Damascus and then hears the Spirit's voice all through the book of Acts. Who does God talk to? Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice. God speaks to us and whomever he wants. But take note that he promises to speak. So we should listen. Second Chronicles says, if my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. God wants us to know his voice, to recognize his voice, so that we can have the most intimate relationship with him that's possible. And just like Adam and Eve in the garden, God wants that, that open relationship with his children. Have you ever wanted to pray, but you weren't really sure what to pray? Maybe your heart was breaking, there was some tragedy in your life, Maybe you were overwhelmed with stress or there was a difficult decision to make and you didn't know if you needed to go left or go right. What do you do? How do you pray? I could say it's simple. I could say you just talk to God. Just talk to him. Yeah. He, he's not a vending machine. He's not a genie in a bottle. He's a sentient being that wants conversation, that wants a relationship with you. So you let him know. You let him know your struggles and stresses. You let him know what's going on in your life. Let him know that your heart is breaking. Let him know that you're confused or that you're thrilled. That's the beginning of your prayer. You know when you have a best friend and you feel comfortable and you share your heart with them? It, everything just feels natural. But if the words don't come out right, then you, you say them as best as you can. And you just say, oh, you know what, I'm, pfft, the words are just coming out, I'll, I don't even know what I'm saying. This is, just, this is just how the words are coming out, and you explain it the best you can. God's the same way. There's no criticism here about your prayer. He, he, he already knows what's on your heart. He already knows what's on your soul. He already knows what's on your mind. And the great thing is, he understands you because he made you. Now, we're going to shift gears just a little bit because so far we've been saying, you know, let's just have a conversation with God. A conversation is two ways. And uh, 
just allow you know, the conversation to flow freely. It's, it's not a formula, in other words, right? We're saying it's not a formula. So ironically, right now, I wanna give you a formula. <laughs> but let's not think of it as a formula, okay? Let's think of it more as a guide. Because think about your prayers for a moment. Do they sound more like, please God, help me, please God, give me, please God, I need this. Because a simple guide would allow you to remember a few thank yous, showing both of our needs, yes, but also our appreciation. A guide helps us to remember to ask for the things that we need, yes, but also helps us to remember to ask for forgiveness. You've probably sat across from a friend, uh, you know, at brunch, and you've thought to yourself, wow, this conversation is so stale. You know, or it's all one-sided, or it's awkward silence, I don't know what to say. You don't want your prayers to be like that. We can say the same thing over and over again sometimes in prayer, and it starts to feel like we're in a rut. And there's probably a few acronym guides out there. I'm sure you know one or two. I've probably even preached one or two before. It's a good reminder. So we're going to use the word pray. P-R-A-Y. Okay? Pray. So the P stands for praise. Praise. This is a great place to start. We start here. We start with God. We begin our prayer with praise. We begin our prayer with worship. We begin our prayer with adoration. We begin by saying, to God be the glory. Right? That's just how we start when we're in church. What's the first thing we do when people walk in the door? We sing right? We sing and we start with music. We start with praise. We start with worship. This means we begin our prayers by acknowledging how great God is. Because when we start by praising God, what we're doing is we're setting the tone for our entire prayer. We're reminding ourselves that it's not about us, that it's about intimacy. And we're stepping into the throne room. So we don't, we don't rush it. We don't rush that moment. We give God the time and the attention that he deserves. We're going to give God adoration. We're going to give God praise. So we slow down. We don't rush right into the things that we need. We shift our focus, right? We shift our focus off of ourselves and on to God. Why start with praise? Well, the Bible commands it. Number one, the psalmist says in Psalm 150, let everything that has breath, praise the Lord. Praise also opens up access to God. Psalm 100 says, enter his gates with thanksgiving. Enter his courts with praise. Another reason, God is surrounded by praise. You know that? Right now, in heaven. You know, a couple weeks ago, we were talking about heaven and what the throne room looked like. And we said that God is continually surrounded by beings and elders and angels that sing his praise. That's the picture of heaven. Psalm 23 says, enthroned upon your praises of his people. Do you know that praise also promotes productivity? According to the word, the earth yield its produce in the presence of praise. Psalm 67 says, let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. The earth has yielded its increase God, our God shall bless us. God shall bless us. Now, does that mean that crops will actually grow better where praise is present? Maybe. Why not? Fifth, praise will chase away despair. You know, there's no better way to beat the blues than to change your focus off of yourself and onto God. The book of Isaiah says, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the garment of praise instead of a faint spirit, that they may be called the oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. Sixth, praise is an effective weapon against darkness. The Bible says that whenever he felt overwhelmed or defeated by the enemy, when the weight of leadership was too great to bear, when Saul called for David, he would come and ask him to sing, to sing praises, to relieve that stress to relieve that weight of darkness, to heal him. Saul sought out worship. 
1 Samuel 16 says, Whenever the harmful spirit from, the, from God was upon Saul, David took the lyre and played it with his hand. So Saul was refreshed and all was well, and the harmful spirit departed from him. Another reason to start with praise? Only God is worthy of it. Only God is worthy of our praise. Psalm 145 says, The Lord is great and worthy of our praise. Now, sure, we might occasionally praise or encourage a friend or a family member, but only God deserves our heartfelt worship and our allegiance. When we praise God, we are reminded of all of his attributes. We praise him because he comforts us when we're going through hard times. We praise him because he is the God of grace and compassion. We praise him because God gives us perfect love. We praise him because he forgives all of our sins, even the really horrible ones. We praise him because he will never leave us. We praise him because he will never forsake us. We praise him because of his amazing peace, and we praise him because of his amazing grace. We praise him because he is always faithful, and we praise him because, most importantly, he is listening to us. In that moment, he is listening to your prayer. And while we're praising God, we can also give him thanks for all the blessings that we're receiving. Thanks for loved ones. Thank you for homes, for clothes, for material belongings, for jobs, for our church, for our health. And if you want to pray through the book of Psalms, there's a bunch of praise-filled Psalms that you can pray. Uh, Psalm 8, 19, 23, 46, 95, 100, 148, and 150. Okay, so that was P in prayer. That takes us to R. R is repent. The R in pray is repent. Now, maybe to some it would seem that confessing or repenting is pretty obvious, right? Just tell God your sins. But this is, again, another part that I would urge you, don't rush it. Don't rush it. We have this tendency to kind of lump all of our sins together and we just kind of whitewash everything and we say, Lord, forgive me of my sins. And we group them all together. Isaiah 59 says, Your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. Why are we lumping them all together? Remember, God speaks to naked people. This is our time to be real. This is our time to be intimate. God already knows all of our sins anyway, so why are we hiding them? Plus, when we confess our sins, we have this opportunity to have ourselves feel released from them. Confession helps lift that big, boulderous weight off of our shoulders, and I don't know, we might be led to tears, but hopefully we experience peace. 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just, and he will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Those are great words. Those are powerful words. They talk about God and his nature and his character. But in order for us to experience that, then we first have to experience repentance, recognizing what we did, admitting that that thing we did was wrong. Prayer is an opportunity that we get to make things right. So it was P, that was R, and that takes us to A in pray. A is asking, asking. Now, in the Lord's Prayer, when Jesus taught us to pray, there was a lot of elements to that where we ask, right? We ask for our daily bread. We asked God to lead us not into temptation, but to deliver us from evil. And I think those are the easy ones, right? We always remember to ask for things in prayer. We probably rarely ever pray without asking for something. But you know, we said earlier that God is all-knowing. God is all-knowing. So you might wonder, okay, well, if God already knows what I need in my life, then why do I need to ask? James 4.2 tells us we don't receive because we do not ask. You know what that means? It means we have to ask. <laughs> it means if we want anything, we have to ask for it. Why? Well, maybe because when we ask for something, when we say it out loud, right, 
we, we realize in that moment while we're talking that maybe that thing that we're asking for isn't a need. You know, you, you spend your first part of your prayer praising God, talking about how great God is and thanking him for all the wonderful things he gives you. And then you shift into your second part of your prayer where you confess. By the time you get to asking, you realize how silly some of the things are that we ask for. Maybe those things that we're asking for aren't needs. Maybe they're just wants. You know, if you're going into the throne room and you're praising God and you're giving him glory, it really starts to put everything into perspective. It puts your prayer into perspective. Yes, nothing's going to happen unless we ask. And asking is how we communicate our needs. And it's the, it's the way that we have access to unleash those things in our life. But there's a reason why asking comes at this point. Because it helps us assess what we really need. Where we really need God's hand to move. What we really need his help with. You have the opportunity to be in the throne room to ask the creator of the universe for anything. It really shifts your priorities around. What are the things that are important? That takes us to why. P-R-A-Y. Why is yielding. Yielding, you know, like the yellow diamond traffic sign that says yield, right? It means slow down. Because I think the greatest aspect of a prayer right here is this last part. And we are supposed to yield to God's will right? Prayer should be God's will. And that's the most difficult, especially coming after asking, right? A lot of the things we ask for are the things that we want, and we usually want them right away. In the Gospel of John, Jesus tells us a couple of times that we should pray in his name. In John 14, Jesus says, I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son, if in my name you ask me for anything, I will do it. But what does that mean? Is that, is that, does that mean that we simply just conclude every single one of our prayers by saying, in Jesus' name, just for the sake of getting what we want? Is that how we sign off on a prayer? It seems to be, right? We all say it, in Jesus' name, amen. No, praying the name of Jesus means that, we, that what we pray is God's will. Praying in Jesus' name is a recognition that Jesus is the mediator between us and God, and that we do not even deserve to have an audience with the Father. It is a recognition that we only have authority to come into the throne room because of Jesus. We enter on behalf of our high priest. He has prepared the way for us. And when we pray in Jesus' name, what it means is, I am unworthy of approaching the throne of grace. Jesus is my advocate, and I am here on behalf of him. I am here because of him. Should we say the words in Jesus' name at the end of our prayers? Yes. If saying in Jesus' name reminds us by whose authority we have been invited then it's an excellent praise. But if we think that we say, in Jesus' name, if we think that invoking that somehow just makes God the subject of our, of our own will, then it's horrible. 1 John 5 says, this is the confidence we have in approaching God, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we asked of him. We mess this one up a lot. We hear the part that says, if we ask, he hears us. And if he hears us, we will get what we ask. But that's not what John says. He says, if we yield, right? He says, if you yield. If we ask according to what? His will. Then God hears us, and since he hears us, we know that we will receive what we asked of him. This is the hard part. Yielding is the hard part. 
Yielding to God is doing what we see Jesus do in his prayer when he prays in the garden before the cross. In Luke 22, it says Jesus went out, as was his custom, to the Mount of Olives, and the disciples followed him. And when he came to the place, he said to them, Pray that you may be not entered into temptation. And he withdrew from them about a stone's throw and knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. See, Jesus prayed that he would not have to face the cross. But he concludes his prayer by yielding. He concludes his prayer by saying, I am obedient and I will follow your will. And that's a shift. That is another shift we need to make in our prayer life. We need to shift the conversation, right? We need to say, you know what? Our prayer is not about us. It's about the relationship. And I need to listen as much as I speak. But at the same time, we have to shift the whole purpose of the prayer. We have to shift how we think about it, our mindset, that this is not about our, our asking and our needs and our wants. It's about yielding to his will. How do we know? How do we know if it is God's will? By listening. You know, he, he wants to speak to you. But if you don't ever stop and listen, you're never going to know what God wants you to do. You read in John 10, 27, Jesus said, My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. If you're one of his sheep, you need to recognize your master's voice. So just as we close here, I want to mention a couple of things, a couple of other things that might help us uh, in our prayer life. First, remember to wait. Remember to wait. Isaiah 40 says, but they wait upon the Lord and they shall renew their strength. They shall mount up their wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Ask God to help you. Shut off all the other thoughts and the to-do lists, and the schedules. This is your task. We are supposed to wait upon the Lord. We are supposed to listen. Second, let God lead. Let God lead the prayer. Jesus says in Luke 22, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. Ask God to lead your prayer time, to show you what to pray about. Ask him to show you what to pray for. And third, when he shows you, follow. Follow his guidance. Scripture says in Ephesians 6, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the saints. You know, when you feel that prompting while you're praying, don't think to yourself, oh, I'll get to that later. Or, you know, what, what was that about? If something's prompting you, if the Spirit is prompting you, then stop and pray for that. Pray for that thing in that moment, right there. There's some subject that the Spirit is asking you to move on, to think about, to something to consider. And I would say if, if you get that thought and it pops in your head, follow his lead, follow his guidance. And finally, take your time. Take your time in prayer. Remember, you are meeting with the King of Kings. So he deserves priority in your life and he deserves priority in your schedule. Prayer is not something that you should rush. Even Jesus, he had a busy schedule. People wanted to see him and talk to him all the time, but he made it a priority to spend time in prayer. It takes time to be a good listener. It takes patience to be a good listener. Some other tips I could help you out with. Um, uh, it's easier for me to pray out loud for me. It's easier to pray out loud. That helps me stay focused in a prayer. You know, if I pray silently, then my mind wanders and pretty soon I'm thinking about housework or some task or project or anything else and I have to reshift myself and refocus on the prayer. Uh, others have said that writing things down helps them. Having a journal, that can help. Many people prefer to write out their prayers. For some, that helps them feel a little closer to God, especially if you're a creative type, you doodle, you draw, uh, you're artistic, that, that openness and that creativity might help you uh, write down your thoughts. And really, that's, that's what the hymnal 
is, right? That's what the book of Psalms is. It's, it's a, a prayer that's been written out. It's God's praise that's been written down on paper. It's, it's, it's you exposing your soul to God. You're, and the great thing is, again, your words don't have to be fancy. They don't have to be polished. They don't have to rhyme. Let it come from your soul. And lastly, don't think of prayer as something that needs to be long or needs to be wordy. In fact, I would say, you know, your first goal should be to pray more often, not pray longer. I don't want you to listen to this and think, well, my prayers need to be longer. David said to slow down and to take my time, so I need to start praying longer prayers. No, I I would shoot for more often before longer. For example, you know, every, every hour has 60 minutes. Why not give God two or three every hour? As your day moves along, you pray for a few minutes. Maybe your first hour when you wake up, you just, you, do, you use that as your time to pray and, and, uh, about adoration and praise. You give God your morning praise and then the next hour, you thank him for things. The next hour is confession. Stop and meditate on the meanings and the blessings that you get. Spend more of your day in prayer. Spend, because that's what you would do if you had a best friend. You wouldn't just talk to them once for you know, 12 minutes in the morning and just never speak to them again for the rest of the day. You, you see them every, every so often throughout the day and you speak to them and you share how the day is going. Prayer shouldn't be uh, a chore that you just have to do and that you, you have to get it out of the way. It, should, it shouldn't be your duty. It shouldn't be like, oh, you know what? I, I gotta call the parents. I gotta call the kids. It's my, it's my duty. No, Paul says, pray without ceasing, right? So in other words, you, sh- you should have your whole heart set on God. You should be constantly thinking about him or maybe even anticipating, you know, something that happened in the hour and then you look forward and you say, oh, you know, you know I know I, what I really wanna pray about this next hour. I know what I'm really going to, you know, I've been thinking about this and, you know, my prayer earlier and I think my next prayer, I think I really know the direction I want to go. And how do you get better at anything? Repetition, right? Doing something again and again until it's natural, until it's a habit, until you can't imagine your life without it. Take that small shift. Make prayer a part of your life. Make that conversation a part of your life. Shift that focus off of yourself and onto him. Yield to him. Let's pray together. Lord, I bow my heart before you and I give you honor and I give you praise. God, strengthen my prayer life. Help me to pray more. Nudge me to pray, even when I'm doing something mindless. Help me to truly know who I am and my place in your world. Help me to understand that you always hear me. Help me to know your word so that I can pray it, to write down my prayer needs and the needs of others, and to know that you really do know me. You listen to me. Help me listen. Help me yield. Help me to know your will. These things I ask in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. Thanks for joining us this morning. Thanks for spending some time with us. And of course, we miss you. We would love to have you back in service. We have two opportunities for worship every single week. We have a 930 service with our choir. And uh, we would love to have you in choir as well. We have choir practice on Tuesdays at 630. If you like to sing, you'll be part of a small group. Uh, The choir would love to have you participate. And then we have our second service on Sundays, which is at 11 o'clock. It's more contemporary. We have a worship band, and that is the same time that we offer a children's program and our youth group. Our youth group also meets during the week, Wednesdays at 6 o'clock. And you can just have your kids bike on over with their bikes or skateboards. We feed them dinner, and they play a game, and they usually get out around uh, around 7.30. Thanks for watching. I'll see you guys next time. Bye.